Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. So we have a really good conversation lined up tonight. This was prompted by a couple of things that I do to try to help out in the community. I do a lot of mentoring for new folks who are coming in to cybersecurity. And, you know, I talked to two this week and help them look over their resumes and try to mentor them in, in the skills and what they really need to do to try to break into the industry. One of them told me that they had applied for almost 300 different jobs and hadn't gotten a response. And so I think this is a general frustration for a lot of folks who are trying to break into the industry. And I'm hoping that the conversation that we have tonight will help try to change some of the minds of the hiring managers and the teams that are trying to hire these people of this perceived talent gap, as well as try to help the people who are trying to break in, maybe play the quote unquote game better because unfortunately just part of the reality is that there are certain things that hiring managers are going to look for. And if you're not playing the game, right, then you're not even going to get looked at. So one of the things that came across my Twitter feed was this blog by AT&T's cybersecurity team. And it had a YouTube video about these guys basically having a round table talking about is there or is there not an entry level position into cybersecurity. And if you watch the video, it's not very long. I do recommend that you watch the video. It's about 13 minutes long. You'll get the sense that these guys think that there are no entry-level positions. And they say things like, you know, cybersecurity itself isn't a field, that there are a lot of things within cybersecurity, a lot of different cybersecurity domains. And that's oftentimes when I start mentoring someone and they say, hey, I want to pivot into cybersecurity. The first question that I ask is, what do you want to do in cybersecurity? And they oftentimes will say, I want to be a hacker. I want to pen test. I want to be on a red team. And I think that is overwhelmingly the response that I get when I ask new people. But, you know, there's a lot of different things. There's defense. There's research. There's education. There's compliance, governance. I mean, there's so many different domains of cybersecurity. And it's more than just hacking And so I think most people, when they pivot in, you really need to research the different domains, what they do, and you need to figure out what you want to do within cybersecurity, which will help you develop skills and knowledge to get into that area. When they talk about the different skill sets that you need, they refer to this blog, which I'll link in our show notes, about what security managers expect you to do day one. And this blog, when you read through it, has five different scenarios, which I think are really interesting and we should talk about them because these are legitimate scenarios that you could have that security managers are looking for you to do that day one, how you can make an impact for that company the day that you're hired. No ramp up needed. You know, you need, you have these skills already. So I'll just read a couple of the scenarios for you. So for example, if you're at a smaller company that doesn't have an endpoint protection, this may be a legitimate scenario. Your manager tells you that the CISO read about endpoint protection on the wall of an airport. So now we need to do one immediately. It is your job to find the best one. This happens all the time. Now, maybe take it as a different product, maybe not endpoint protection, maybe it's secure email gateway, or maybe it's an identity provider, or it's a network detection and response tool. Insert whatever tool. We need it now. Find the best one and implement it, right? And so that's a legitimate scenario. Do you have the skills necessary today 
if I were to hand you that task to do that. Another one that I wanted to highlight is a coding one that, in fact, you know, as I go through this list, there are several of them that I think to myself, yeah, I could do that at a company. When I got to this one on the list, I was thinking, no, I don't think I can handle this one. So this one is your group has gotten access to a new domain blacklist and it has a pretty well documented API. But now that makes five total blacklists that your team is subscribed to. Your team lead asks you to create a single internal API that queries all of them with extremely fast performance. And I thought, well, I'm not a really good coder. I don't think I could create this without a lot of effort. So suffice to say that there are a lot of skill sets that are needed within cybersecurity, and you may not be an expert on all of them, but these are legitimate scenarios that hiring managers are looking for. And I thought it would be good to at least think about that in the fact that if you read these and you're like, yeah, I could do that today and I don't have any experience. Well, hey, you could do the role, right? You could be in the role to do this API creation if you had good coding skills or you're self-taught or whatever. Or maybe you're like me and you are able to talk to vendors and find the best endpoint protection and implement that. I think reading through this list of scenarios and thinking about it as someone coming into cybersecurity with legitimate scenarios that you could think to yourself, could I or could I not do this? is a good exercise. Andy, when we were talking about this in the pre-show, my first response to this is that this is gatekeeping. The blog on Daniel Meisler's site uh, with all these different scenarios because they're very different in what they're asking. And so asking a candidate to show up day one and be able to accomplish all of these, I think is asking a lot. And, you know, at some point, I think during this conversation, we need to define what we're even talking about by quote unquote entry level. But that was my first response. But as we talk through it, you said this could serve as an example for skills you may have from another role that you've been in. For example, the coding example you just gave or being able to work with vendors that translates across many different IT disciplines and being able to do that for security tooling is very valuable as well, because there's a lot of security vendors with a lot of Salesforce folks out there uh, trying to land their product. Hi. And uh, so I think from that perspective of looking through that list and going, oh, I could do that. Oh, I could do that. That shows you that cybersecurity isn't necessarily, you know, all red hat hacking, you know, typing on the keyboard really fast, like in a Hollywood movie as the matrix code, you know, moves across your face. Like there's, there's more to it than that. And there's a lot of different skills needed. What I did love about Daniel, Daniel Measler's blog here was he called out soft skills as, and we're big fans of soft skills on the blue security podcast. And we have talked about many, many times the value of being able to be persuasive to be able to communicate effectively. And he gets into a bit of that as well. He talks about the value of in, in his blog, being able to write succinctly, which is a something I'm still working on, but being able to write succinctly and clearly because clear writing shows clear thinking. And I agree with that a hundred percent. So I think after we talk through it, kind of align to a lot of what he was getting at and a lot of what he was thinking. The one thing I'll say on the note of, you know, cybersecurity itself isn't a field, like there's different domains and you should have an idea what you want to do first. That's hard. I will tell you a personal story that I went to college uh, to get a management information systems degree, which is an MIS degree through the College of Business at Iowa State University. And it's a good program. And I remember going to the career fair and these different companies asked me like, what do you want to do in IT? And I had no clue. Like I'd gone through this program, I'd even interned and done an internship with a lot of hands-on experience for Hy-Vee, which is a major upper Midwest grocery chain. And my internship was drive around to all these stores and do technology upgrades by yourself with nobody looking over your shoulder, install network switches, install um, wireless switches, uh, re-image servers, update BIOS and servers, reinstall Exchange Server, all sorts of different stuff. Do Windows mobile devices. It was crazy what all we did. A lot of hand-on experience. And I still got done with that in, that internship 
and got out of college and didn't even know like the different disciplines of IT. So I think it's okay too if you don't know what those are yet. Um, but having some idea, like take the time to know them. If I had walked into those career fairs, I might've had better luck if I could have articulated, like I'm interested in infrastructure or I'm interested in personal productivity or endpoint management. If I knew those kind of different disciplines ahead of time, I probably would have resonated better with the hiring managers, none of whom hired me. So you can learn a little bit from my mistake in that. It's, it's okay to not know, but if you educate yourself ahead of time and try to learn what the different disciplines are, maybe pick out a couple that are interesting to you and being able to speak to the why, I think that's one of those things that can help in a career search. As I watched the video, at first I was kind of nodding along and almost agreeing with what they were saying, but then as they started to get into it, I started to disagree more and more with what their line of thinking was where it was more of a, a legacy way of thinking about cybersecurity, especially when, you know, one of the guys said, Hey, maybe you need to pay your dues somewhere and, and learn like an entry level it job. I do believe that you need certain skills and we have talked about this on a different podcast, the amount of technical knowledge that you need to get into cybersecurity, which is why a lot of people think it's not an entry level job. There is a link that they talked about the different pathways uh, in the video and they show different feeder jobs that can go into cybersecurity where they talk about maybe you're in a related field like sysadmin or networking or a developer. And then you get into cybersecurity and you take those skills that you t learn from another feeder role into cybersecurity. So maybe a developer will turn into an AppSec person or sysadmin will turn into like a device management, uh, you know, security person, something like that. But I believe that there are a lot of ways to get that type of experience nowadays. Like Adam, you talked about not knowing back then the different parts of IT or maybe People nowadays don't know where to start, but information is all out there now. I think a lot of people can research this stuff on their own and learn about the different domains and different areas of IT if you're not certain. And that's part of being in cybersecurity or being in IT in general is looking stuff up. I can't tell you how many times I talk to my mentees and say, I don't know everything. The amount of time that in the day that I look something up on the internet is, I mean, handful to like maybe, you know, 20, 25 times a day. Um, so, you know, there's different ways to get that experience today and to demonstrate your excellence in that. If you're a developer, you can publish your code on GitHub. If you're doing some sort of IT work on the side, you can publish blogs. And unfortunately, I think certifications is still a big part of kind of escalating your resume to the top of the pile. It's it's just part of the game, like I talked about, where, you know, maybe there's an automated resume scanner that's looking for keywords and they'll pick up on a certification or something like that. So there was another article that I read about the top security certs that are kind of out there. I still think an entry level one that's really good is the Security Plus We've talked about Microsoft certifications being really good as well because a lot of people use Microsoft products and on the cost level, they're usually a lot cheaper than a lot of the other certs that are out there. The one in the articles that they mentioned were all SAN certifications like the Instant Handler and the GX Certified Forensic Analysis uh, certifications. I mean, SANS courses are super expensive. They're like $3,000 in order to take their certs. Uh, whereas like a Microsoft cert is like $160 or something like that. Security plus is like $300. There's another one that I wanted to mention, which is blue team. Blue team has a really good practical exam at the end. Um, and same thing with the TCM security. There's a practical network penetration penetration tester certification as well, which has a practical test. And I think those demonstrate 
at least when you get the cert that you have the capabilities to get through an actual practical. The OSCP is oftentimes kind of the gold standard for offensive uh, security, and those will also have a practical as well. So, I mean, those are some of the certifications. There's a ton out there, but having one or two of those on your resume will never hurt. It always kind of just elevates you to that top of the pile and maybe we'll get you that call from the recruiter. I really liked this link that's going to be in the show notes on cyberseek.org with the pathways to cybersecurity because cybersecurity is a really, it's not a discipline. It's interdisciplinary. It's a cross discipline where you need to be skilled in multiple different areas. I think that's what how I kind of fell into it by accident because I really wasn't good at any one thing, but I know a little bit about everything. And and that's kind of been always my kind of technical background is I can, I can speak some networking and I can speak some like scripting and I understand, you know, fundamental composition of operating systems and really even the history of operating systems, which sometimes is relevant when you're trying to break them. And so what I liked about that pathways to cybersecurity is it showed like, here's the different fields you can kind of come out of. And that gets you experience in one or more disciplines from which you can move into cybersecurity and start to, you know, broaden your horizon. So I like that. I also, and and it sounds like I'm taking a position here, which maybe I am, but I also just, just like that mindset in, in that because it's not, it's, it's more interdisciplinary you have to kind of get some experience in some of those feeder roles first. So I guess it sounds like I'm agreeing that maybe it's not entry level, but I think just in the sense of there, there's more than one way to build that experience, but you do need to demonstrate that in some way, shape or form first, you can't show up and say, well, I know nothing about technology um, and, and be successful. I mean, there's some roles you can even do maybe that you still could, but anyhow, I like the pathways, check that out. I thought that was good. Uh, on the subject of like demonstrating your competency, I love kind of talking about like showing these side projects as far as GitHub or publishing blogs. I mean, to be honest, not that I want to encourage everybody to go start a podcast because <laughs> there's a ton of them out there and it's it's really hard and time consuming to to do. Andy and I can both tell you that, but this for us was kind of a way to show, you know, our skills and capabilities and, and has been honestly beneficial for our career development doing, doing this podcast. And you don't have to do a podcast, but doing anything just like beyond your nine to five does help kind of build your portfolio. So when people say like, you know, what are you, been, what have you been up to? What are you skilled at? You can point them to something, being able to link somebody to a blog or a YouTube video or a podcast or a GitHub repository. That's super helpful in, in building your story and building your case. And then kind of the last thing you talked about certs, and I want to take a step back before we talk about certs and kind of make a broader point here. And that is about pragmatism versus idealism. Okay. There is an idealism that a lot of cybersecurity hiring and the way we think about it is wrong and it needs to change. And Andy and I are both on that train. Cybersecurity hiring has some room to grow, to put it mildly. However, sometimes you have to work within the system as it exists today, and that's pragmatism. And so I saw something really funny on LinkedIn the other day, and I sent it to Andy, and basically the the gist of the joke was your attackers don't have certifications. You know, the guys breaking in, guys or gals, um, or non-binary people who are breaking into your network and, and you know, stealing your stuff or, or encrypting your stuff, they don't have certs. You know, so why, why do you as a defender need to have certs? Well, I mean, certs are dumb. Certs are a money-making industry, blah, blah, blah. We can have all these idealistic takes on certs, but Andy's right in the sense that when you are trying to pass through these initial gatekeeper algorithms, anything you can put on your resume to, to, you know, win the bonus round and move to the next level helps you. And so again, idealistic Adam says certs are dumb and they should go away. Pragmatic Adam says, you're going to need certs potentially to get your foot in the door or to get started in the industry. Don't go crazy with them. I think something as modest as security plus is helpful and gives you that little tiebreaker edge. And Andy already had a great discussion on those. So I have nothing to add there, but I do just want to say like, anytime you're feeling that idealism rise up in the back of your throat 
and you want to get upset at the world for the way it is, fight the man. Let's get everybody to do better. Let's improve hiring. Heck yeah, on board with that. But if you need a job, sometimes you got to address the job market head on as it exists today. And there are some problems with it, but instead of fighting that, try to figure out the way to win at that. Try to figure out the way to, to win within that existing construct, no matter how much you personally think it's stupid. Yeah, well said. And as you were talking, it, it almost felt like you were thinking that there wasn't an ev- entry-level job. I, I do think that there are some entry-level positions where you could walk onto the job with virtually no knowledge about kind of computing and how it works. And that would be probably like a SOC analyst where you're just kind of triaging alerts and making sure that, you know, if this is an alert that needs to be escalated to the next team to investigate further, you know, that level one SOC analyst where it's a, a shift role, maybe where it's not even a nine to five, maybe you're working the graveyard shift, you know, they, that may be an entry level position where you're taught, a specific system, how to triage alerts, what to look for. And you might not have to have a deep knowledge of all of these other IT things like Active Directory or Identity or specifically how to architecture, you know, different servers together. Maybe you just need to know what the alert looks like. And in the alert, we'll have different language and you're triaging that. So... There are ways I think you can build that. And if you succeed in that, maybe you'll get to a next role. But like Adam said, day one, either you have the knowledge or you don't. And whether I think when you talk about demonstrating that knowledge to a hiring manager, that's where the process needs to change, right? I think hiring managers need to have a better way of thinking about what they're looking for instead of seeing someone on their resume not have the experience or whatever and just dismissing them right away. So there was another article that I read that talked about how if you're having trouble finding the right talent, maybe you're part of the problem. We have over 500,000 open positions in cybersecurity. That sounds crazy just to say. And a lot of people talk about this talent shortage or this skill gap. But I think if you watch that video that I talked about in the beginning and this legacy way of thinking, it's that narrow mindset of who can excel in the field that really starts to create roadblocks for people who don't fit that traditional mold. Adam and I have talked about how we entered in you know, cybersecurity and how we got into the field. And they're not traditional. I mean, they're, there's not a straight line. So I think this article talked about a lot of different things about how you need to reevaluate your hiring processes, how a lot of hiring panels may just have one type of person and, you know, a mold of that type of person. And that's similar to me bias. Like you want someone who's from a similar background or who looks like you who will be a cultural fit instead of like what they can contribute culturally to the team. So Adam has a great talking track on this about building a, a diverse team, but I think this is absolutely necessary to think about candidates who come from different backgrounds and what they can bring to your team because, Hey, we're still getting breaches. We're still getting hacked and what we're doing may be just a result of everyone's thinking the same thing. And we've just been going down the same path. And if you bring some new blood to the team, some new talents, people who haven't had that same way of looking at it, then maybe they have a brand new idea that we haven't tried before, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and, and I think this is an interesting shift here, moving from what I just got done saying around as a candidate, there are flaws in the hiring process, but you need to be pragmatic and work through them. And now we have kind of shifted the lens to those doing the hiring what are those ways you could be better? What are those things to consider? And talking about, again, I've made this point many times on the show, so I'm not going to like completely repeat myself, but attackers are diverse. And so we need teams that are diverse to protect against them because our attackers are not all um, white American males in their thirties and forties. So, and Andy, I think we've talked about this as well. The whole, how's that working out for you thing? 
you know, we, we have traditionally cybersecurity has been, you know, in this country, white American males um, who all subscribe to a best of breed strategy of buying different solutions from different vendors and buying the hot vendor for each solution. And, you know, how's that working out for you? Kind of question is, is a good one to ask at this point. We, we have room to grow in cybersecurity and room to improve. And I think this is one of the ways building a diverse team that can really, really help. And, uh, when you think about the, the talent shortage, you know, that predated all of the conversation we're having today now kind of in the middle of and, and slash post COVID where we've heard phrases like the great resignation or the great reshuffle as Microsoft and Lincoln LinkedIn refer to it, but everybody's having trouble hiring now, but cybersecurity, that problem predated the pandemic that was happening before then. And so certainly it hasn't gotten any easier and finding ways to different ways to find talent, to bring talent up to speed are, are going to be critical for companies to succeed moving forward. Um, because for a lot of companies today, as, as I talk to them, as I talk to my different customers, the message I get over and over, which really frightens me is they can't manage the tools they have today. They can't keep up with the workload of today. And they can't find any help or they don't have budget to get help. And I am concerned as the threats are only growing to going to grow and intensify if we can't keep up with what we're doing today. So, you know, not a lot to add here. I think Andy, you've, you've got even more to kind of talk through um, as far as things to look at, as far as the hiring process and everything else. Um, but this is an area where we have to do better. Yeah. Like you talk about this great resignation and how I think candidates these days have even more power in the hiring process. When I was at my previous company and we were trying to hire people and I was advertising these jobs and people were reaching out to me, the number one question I got by far was, is this position remote? And I think if you haven't changed your mindset that remote work is possible and remote work can succeed, then I think you're again in that legacy way of thinking. If you think that people need to be on site. Now there are positions absolutely that people need to be on site for. I don't think cybersecurity in general is one of those across the board. I think for the majority of positions in the domain, maybe for a SOC analyst, uh, in a secure environment, you need to actually be in the SOC. But for the majority of positions, security architects, researchers, all that stuff can be done remote. And so I think if you're still requiring people to be on site, you're going to be one of those people who are going to be looking for help for a very, very long time. As well as, you know, be prepared to answer questions that may ask about your team, your culture, because it's about how the candidate feels about the company and their values. I think that that is becoming more and more important. It's almost like the candidate is interviewing the company instead of you interviewing the candidate. So how you answer some of their questions, like for example, what is the composition of your team by race and gender? What is the company's philosophy on work-life balance? Will I be the only non-binary person on your team and how you answer those questions when they come at you is going to be very important. The tone that you take is going to be just as important as the content that you're, that you're giving to them. So be prepared for those and to think about how you can be more diverse as well as, you know, looking at people's backgrounds. Maybe you should start rethinking degree requirements or the pedigree that they come from, right? Some of the best people in the industry in cybersecurity do not have a high school degree. They don't have a college degree. As a hiring manager, you can give recruiters explicit guidance on what is required for the position. One of the things that my former boss did was he said that the degree associated with the position could be a non-technical degree. 
So instead of saying that it had to be a engineering degree or a cybersecurity degree, I think he put in their business degree. And I actually had a person who was questioning me when I posted the position. He's like, why does this, why does this job description have a business degree? And I didn't know either. So I went to my boss and asked him and he said, well, I put that in there because I really wanted to widen the pipeline for people who were trying to apply for the position. And I think, you know, that's that kind of thinking, maybe even go a little bit further, no degree at all. Maybe just work experience could count. I've seen that in job descriptions, but you know, think about different job descriptions and how you can widen that pipeline. And Another thing is, as I was in the industry and trying to move up, compensation has definitely been a difficult topic to broach. First off, if you're a hiring manager, definitely don't ask about previous comp compensation because, number one, it's banned in several states. But if you make an offer based on their past compensation, it can undervalue candidates who may come from a non-traditional background. And I think that that is really important. Like you should think about the candidate's skills and what they can bring to your team and make a offer based on that. Right. So obviously I know that within certain HR requirements, there are pay bands that you probably have to stay within, but try to have, be flexible. Like at my previous company, again, we had a guy who was interviewing for a, a compliance analyst position as par part of our cybersecurity team. And he was so good that my manager decided to pull forward a rec that we hadn't even posted yet for the compliance manager and offered him the position for the compliance manager position instead. So it's those type of things that you're making an offer based on what the candidate can do for your team instead of, you know, based on their past experience and their, their past compensation. I love having a business degree, <laughs> uh, having, so at Iowa state in the college business, you, and I assume this is similar to a lot of, a lot of other college businesses, you end up taking 300 level courses in like every different specialty of the college. So I took a class in operations. I took a, a class in logistics and supply chain management, a class in marketing, a class in accounting, a class in finance. And to me, when I was in IT and today at Microsoft, it is very valuable to have a really solid understanding of how accounting works, how finance works, uh, how logistics works, how operations works, being able to speak that language. I mean, just one 300 level class, but still really, really valuable. And I think that's a great example of something. I love hearing that, that your former uh, boss, Andy, you know, open it up to folks like that. Cause I think that's a ton of helpful knowledge. IT at, at the end of the day exists to serve the business. So having the knowledge of all those different business components is super valuable. And I will say the best team I was ever on the highest performing team that accomplished more than any other team I've ever been on was me and two other gentlemen. All of us now, by the way, work for Microsoft, uh, but it was me an MIS major. It was another gentleman who had a, and so mine's from an engineering school, Iowa state. The next one was a music major from a private liberal arts college. And the third one had no degree at all. And between the three of us, vastly different educational backgrounds we achieved more than just any other team I've ever worked on. It was phenomenal. Just a great team of, of people that worked super well together. And that just like highlighted me right there. Like education can be a helpful determining factor in, in potential success, but it is by no means like should be a gate preventing other people from getting in the door. And, and one of my, um, one of my best friends from high school, uh, you know, found out that like college really wasn't for him. I mean, he's a super smart guy, like could have done it if he wanted to, but just wasn't his jam. And, and today he's, you know, a technical specialist, um, in, in technical sales and doing fantastic for himself, like in just phenomenal guy and phenomenal talent. And, 
it no longer matters. And I think that's a, something the industry has done really well on is almost universally at, at like big tech companies, at least like the college degree requirements kind of gone. If you can prove that you've got the talent in other ways, you know, they'll, they'll take you on. If you can prove you've got the history and, and the, the job performance, you know, it, it, it becomes not a concern anymore. So I, I love everything you kind of talked through here, Andy. Um, and, and then the other thing too, about, you know, candidates having leverage at this point in the hiring process. Absolutely. And by the way, that's a pro tip to anyone that is out there interviewing. You should be interviewing the company you are trying to get in the door with. You should be vetting them. And even if you pass through the whole process and they want to hire you, maybe you don't want to go work for them. And that's okay. By the way, it is a two way street of vetting, get it out of your head. If you've ever had it in your head that it's one way, cause it's not. And, and I think really today it's both sides should be trying to determine if it's a good fit. And I think the, the best hiring managers I've worked for have always understood that. Like it's always been more of a conversation around, well, you know, we'd like to bring you on board the team, but what do you think? You know, is this a place you can see yourself working? Do you have any questions or concerns about the culture, the expectations of the job? And when you treat it that way as a two-way vetting process, I think that's way, way, way more powerful too. So make sure you know, as a candidate, you have power as well. Do not feel powerless and beholden to these companies, especially today when everyone needs help. And then just finally, you know, what hiring managers can do to kind of narrow that perceived skills gap, the perceived talent shortage. I've often mentioned this to my previous teams is that you should be trying to mentor or do some sort of training while you're at the company. If you think that someone is a good fit for a position or maybe cross training, you know, bring them in, try to give them things, especially if they're curious. One of my uh, great success stories is at my previous company, there was someone from the desktop support team who showed a great interest in cybersecurity was asking for things to do would have a good curiosity. It reminded me a lot about myself. And so, you know, I would give him tasks to do and he showed a great attitude, a great curiosity, you know, just had that hunger for cybersecurity, which is really important. And I advocated for him to get hired for one of the analyst positions when they were opening it up. And, you know, it, honestly, he didn't have a whole lot of experience in cybersecurity itself, but he demonstrated a good work, that work ethic. He knew the company systems. He knew the people. And so that was valuable, you know, bringing that to the team. And he had that insatiable attitude to learn right and so he got the job and i think he's doing really well um so you know offer that mentorship on in your company on your team um and make sure that uh you're bringing those people who you think may be good and bringing them into the field before you move on i think that's a really really good point and i was going to make the same point and i forgot so i'm glad you brought it back up because I think both for hiring managers as well as candidates, both of whom we've kind of targeted different parts of this show at, I think that's a valuable lesson for both of you. If you are trying to get your foot in the door at cybersecurity, I think that is way easier to do at your existing organization than trying to switch organizations, especially if you feel like, you know, you don't have all the skills or talents or whatever you need right away. That's a place where, you're going to have that internal reputation. You're going to have that um, institutional knowledge that can help make you valuable. You can bring things to bear to say, hey, I might not know everything about cybersecurity yet, but I know how the company works. I know the culture. I know the different pieces and different business units. I know how we make money. And I'm really, really good at like this part of our tech stack or this part of our procurement process or whatever you're being hired to do. I think it is way, way easier to switch into that with all of those kind of added knowledge pieces already in place. And 
I think for hiring managers too, you should look internally as much as possible as well. And, and you might even have to go recruiting internally, go knock on some doors of some other managers and say, Hey, you know, I've watched that. So-and-so here at the help desk is like easily our best help desk analyst, like closes tickets, like crazy gives great answers, um, is really, really good with customers. Like let's give him or her, or they a shot to come over and, and do this. And I think that's the right way to go. And I think, again, that applies to candidates and hiring managers alike. Try as much as possible to do that within the existing organization. If, if that's a business you're trying to break into, because you have so many advantages compared to external candidates. The final thing that I wanted to just kind of bring up and chat about real quick is that it can be overwhelming to try to get into cybersecurity with all the different skills and stuff that you need. You can succeed in this industry without having to know everything. And so I wanted to bring this tweet up because I saw it and I thought there was one way of thinking and then there were the people who are responding who have another way of thinking. And so this Tweet is by Frank McGovern. I I follow him on Twitter. He's a cybersecurity architect at a Fortune 100 company. He published a blog that is actually really good about M365 and how to implement it. But his tweet was, Hi, I'm Frank. I'm the sole cybersecurity architect for a Fortune 100 org. I barely know code. I barely know scripting. I barely know containers. I barely know forensics. I've never popped a shell. And as he was going down these things... I was nodding and being like, yep, that's me. Yep, that's me. That's me as well. All of these things, those are me, right? And so his his final statement was, you'll be okay. I depend on coworkers and other SMEs, subject matter experts, to fill me in while I learn. And that's the whole game is that we're always constantly learning. We're not going to know everything. And it's okay that you don't know all of these things. I mentioned in the beginning if you ask me to write an API to pull in five different blacklists of domains, I wouldn't know how to do that. I would have to look it up. I might be able to figure out how to do it, but I don't know how to do it right now. And that's okay. Uh, I just deployed my first container a couple of weeks ago. I didn't even really know what containers were versus VMs. I had a general concept, but I just deployed my first one just a couple of weeks ago. So, These things are major, broad topics. And then what happened was when he tweeted this, there was this guy and and also a couple other ones who had this attitude of, this is why we have problems in cybersecurity. There's people at the top who don't know what they're doing when you know a technical guy like myself comes in and we got to clean it up, or this is why companies are getting popped, that sort of stuff. And... You know, I think that's the wrong attitude because it takes a village, right? That's the, that's the saying, it takes a village to, to raise a child. I mean, it takes a village to keep a company safe. No one person can do it all. There's obviously a lot of really technical people who know how to pop a shell or who know how to code, who know how to script. But you don't necessarily need to know that to be in cybersecurity. For example, Cisco ASAs and Cisco firewalls are pretty common in the industry. And to have an ACL or an access control list on a firewall is a pretty common thing to make sure that you have the right people accessing or having the right domains or IP addresses being blocked or allowed on that access control list. I don't need to know how to get into a Cisco ASA or Cisco firewall using Cisco's proprietary shell and code and be able to add a specific IP address to the ACL. I don't need to know how to do that in order to be successful as a cybersecurity architect. I only need to know that we use Cisco firewalls. We have an ACL in place. If you exported that ACL to me and I looked over the IP addresses, I could verify that these are the right ones to be on the list or ports that are being allowed or blocked. That's all I need to know. I need to be able to audit that sort of thing, but I don't need to necessarily be able to have to go in there myself and 
modify the ACL. So there's a difference. If you're able to do that sort of stuff, great. But as you get into larger and larger companies, there's going to be that separation of duties. So you may not have access to the firewalls. That may only be a networking team, uh, you know, admin role. So, and that's a good thing. Least privileged access, right? That's a thing that we talk about and preach in cybersecurity. So maybe you know how to do that, but that's not your specific job. Now, if you're a network engineer, yeah, that's your job. Or maybe you're a network security engineer and that's your job to actually audit and then also do it. Okay, great. But again, there's a lot of different domains, a lot of different knowledge. You don't need to be an expert in all of them to be successful in the field. This in general, and this goes way broader than cybersecurity, is a toxic mindset that unless you have done X or unless you are capable of doing X, then you have no business being anywhere around it. And this usually will especially pop out if you ever hear a woman call a football game play-by-play announcing, oh boy, um, the sexist will come out of the woodwork on this stuff. But it applies in every field ever. Um, You do not necessarily have to do the thing to be able to do skills around the thing. As far as architecture is different than engineering. And architecture is a really important job. Leadership is a really important job. Mentoring is really important. We did episodes with, with some of Andy's past leaders, both Matt Wood and Doug Turchuk. And if you go listen to Doug's episode in particular, he walks you through as, as a cybersecurity leader, like what he thinks about and what he's trying to accomplish. And the things that keep him up at night, to use a tired phrase, or the things that he's working on require very different skills than pop in a shell. You know, and it doesn't mean that Doug has no business doing what he does. I was very impressed with his thoughtfulness of his answers and the things he was trying to accomplish and how he's trying to accomplish them. It's a different skill set. And so, in whatever business we're talking about, just because you can't do a thing doesn't mean you're not qualified to be around the thing in other ways, because there's more than one way to look at it. And there's more than one skill involved in in building the team and putting it together. You know, a lot of the great, you know, again, sports analysts, like never played the game, like a a Tim Kirchin at ESPN, who does all their baseball analysts. Like he never played baseball, but he's a really good writer. He's a really good on television. He's really good analysts. Like you don't have to play baseball to know how to analyze baseball. And like, that's just, using a totally off the wall example to illustrate the absurdity here. When people say things like that, I bet Frank McGovern is a great cybersecurity architect because his brain isn't filled with all of that stuff. And he can focus on the things that matter. I find architects that see big picture in, in my experience are the best architects. The architects that get way too caught up in the weeds tend to struggle a little more. Because often architecture is seen as a career progression. Like you have to get there. Architect is a very senior position in a lot of orgs, but I think it should be a different career path as opposed to like a promotional achievement. But that's another conversation for another time. Um, Just in general, just stay away from that mindset in anything you do. You know, Um, everyone has something to contribute. And it takes different skills to do different jobs. And some people like pushing the buttons and pulling the levers. And some people like doing other components around that. And that's okay. Like you were saying, this is a pervasive attitude in all career fields. And as you were talking about, I thought of another one in my experience, which is the military. I come from the air force where I served and the officers in the Air Force, the four-star generals, it was for a long time thought of that you could only be a four-star general if you had, quote-unquote, operational experience. And operational experience in the Air Force was being a pilot. And so almost every single four-star general for a very, very long time was a pilot or had some sort of flight experience. It wasn't until recently, because the Air Force has multiple different career fields. You could be an acquisition, you could be a researcher, you could be an engineer. It wasn't until just recently that the first four-star general, who was a non-operational 
officer got promoted to a four-star general. And I bet he's a great four-star general, right? And so try to think about the different skill sets that other people will bring other than what you're perceived, you know, this is what you have to be able to do. Like Adam said, just because you don't know how to do it doesn't mean you can't work around it. So I hope this was a good conversation for both people trying to get into the industry as well as hiring managers and leaders in the industry who are trying to fill their teams I'm hoping that this conversation can try to change some of the perception and attitudes around this talent gap, which I don't really think we have. I just think we need to rethink our pipeline and also open up opportunities for folks from non-traditional backgrounds. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our Contact information will be in the show notes if you guys want to reach out with comments or topics that you guys want to hear us talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.